Okay, welcome to our look at the causes of the Great Depression. Obviously, we've been looking at the roaring 1920s and what they always say about what must what, what goes up must come down, and that's the case here of the U.S. economy. You can see there with a the little image, we're going to go from boom to bust. When you look at the boom to bust situation, we're going to see the United States economy kind of go all the way up almost in a straight line from most of the 1920s, and then we're going to see how it completely collapses in 1929. So some of the objectives for this particular section, we're going to look at the weaknesses in the economy of the 1920s that caused the Great Depression. We're going to explain why the stock market crashed in 1929 and the impact on the economy. We're going to look at the Great Depression as it deepened in the United States, and then the United States being a leading country around the world, both today and even back then. As our economy collapsed, we're going to see other countries around the world suffer in a similar fashion. And then we'll look at the underlying causes of the Great Depression and see how historians kind of differ about uh, their take on the causes of the Depression. Okay, let's take a look at question one. What are the traits of the business cycle? Well, the business cycle is kind of the general idea that the economy tends to go through periodic times of growth, expansion, and then it begins to shrink or contract. There's several factors or traits that impact the economy. They include the employment rates. We usually see this measure kind of issued by the government on a monthly basis. Can we see if the unemployment rate is up or down as they report the jobs out, usually during the first week of each month. We look at the average wages within society. We look at the productivity in our factories. One of the general measures of how well the economy is doing is there a gross national product, or sometimes you see gross domestic product. So GNP or GDP means the same thing. Federal spending, obviously that's a tremendous issue in contemporary society, not so much a big issue during the 1920s, but here we are in the 2020s and it's one of the biggest issues facing our country today. Trade, are we selling or exporting more? then we're importing or buying. Stock market, obviously that's a general measurement on a daily basis. We see that go up and down all day long and then we kind of take a look at the impact of the stock market on a daily basis. And you can see here, this is kind of the traditional business cycle. You see like a boom or expansion, kind of a recession. And we're gonna see ultimately here as we get into the late 1920s and 30s, the depression, recovery, boom, and then kind of goes down. Two, what factors were indicative of the booming 1920s economy? Consumption was high as consumers bought goods that were unavailable during the war. Stock market soared. We mentioned the GNP, or GDP, went up. And then when you think about presidential politics, obviously 100 years later, we're in 2020 looking at uh, presidential issues and things like that in contemporary times. Economic factors are often the most important factor that impacts how a person may vote. So if you look at the economy you know, on election day, and if it's really strong, and a candidate's running for re-election, or is a candidate from the same political party where the economy is strong, they may want to stick with the uh, current situation. If the economy is mediocre or weak, uh, then in contrast, they'll probably vote for the opposition party. The economy is performing well, as I mentioned, they're going to stick with the uh, candidate of the economy is weak, they'll go with the opposition party. Four lists some of the strengths and weaknesses of the American economy today. So this is from a contemporary standpoint, uh, some of the ongoing strengths that we see in a contemporary American economy. Constantly we're seeing new technologies develop throughout history. We're always moving in a more advanced fashion, and we seem to expand much more quickly in terms of the tech economy in contemporary times than obviously we were from, let's say, 1930 to 1940 or 1940 to 1950. But now as we move forward, we're seeing uh, quite a bit of an increase on a regular basis. And today's economy, because of the Internet and web traffic, things like that, global communication, globalization has been a key trait here in the 21st century. Entrepreneurial opportunities, these were available, especially during the turn of the century, the 1800s into the 1900s, and we saw in the 1920s in particular, advertisements and everybody coming out with a new consumer good or product. This, of course, allowed for a lot of profit to be made during the 1920s. Educational opportunities, 
you know, 100 years after, uh, 100 plus years after the 19, 1920, we're seeing a situation where more and more people are going on to technical degrees, associate degrees, and of course, bachelor degrees are at the highest rate throughout history. Unemployment rate today, uh, can, in comparison to the Great Depression, is relatively low. Um, for most of uh, recent history, with the exception of the period of time here uh, post-COVID, the unemployment rate's been relatively low. Today, it's moderately high, around 8%. Stock market's high, all-time records in recent weeks and months. You know, it's kind of gone up a little bit down with the impact of the virus. Constant issue within the American economy is the federal debt or deficit. $27 trillion plus dollars. The government may pass another stimulus bill during the uh, COVID outbreak, and that would add another two to three trillion dollars to the deficit. So I would say that by the time uh, next year rolls around, we'll be you know up and over thirty trillion dollars. Medical cost, obviously, medical cost. You know, an average uh, family policy that's you know kind of a you know, relatively strong healthcare policy cost in the range of thirty plus thousand dollars. You know, maybe even mid thirties in terms of the uh, healthcare policy. So that's a huge impact. You know, middle-class American family with a family income of $100,000, and they have to pay out of pocket for their health care policy of $35,000. So right off the top, of the, you know, right off the top, 35% of their income is going into health care. Entitlements, this is Medicare and Social Security, with our senior population constantly increasing because of the increased life expectancy. The government paying out in Medicare and Social Security is something that's continuing to go up. And of course, we're still dealing with uh, the impacts of COVID-19, and I'm sure we're going to continue to deal with the long-range impact of that for some time. In 1928, Herbert Hoover was running for the presidency. Uh, he was a Republican, and since the economy was really going well in 1928, he attempted to attach his campaign, and every campaign tries to come up with a slogan or an, a general idea for how they feel they should uh, connect with the American public, and a chicken in every pot was a uh, Hoover slogan. He believed most Americans were doing quite well in 1928, but he pointed out that since the economy was booming, that at the same point in time, anybody who was struggling was really entitled to a good square meal, which is what a chicken in every pot kind of represented him, and food on the table and making sure all Americans were taken care of. Okay, six, how did many farmers get into debt in the 1920s? Explain how World War I and crop prices impacted farmers during this time period. Uh, developments in new farm technologies, equipment, pesticides, these are all costly things during the uh, period of time of World War I. And as a result, because the demand for crops was so high, they wanted to make as much money as possible. They borrowed a lot of money and went into debt to kind of meet the demand of World War I. After the war, they continued to produce crops at the same level, which led to overproduction and an overall collapse in the farm product price. As we move on to number seven, explain why the large gap between the rich and the poor led to economic instability. Uh, productivity of workers increased 32% during the 1920s. Corporate profits increased 65% during the 1920s, while worker wages increased just 8%. By 1929, the wealthiest 1% earned the same amount as the bottom 42%. So the key thing here is not to memorize statistics or anything like that. It's kind of to get an overview of how things were going during this period of time. And the key message and the key thing to understand from these uh, couple points here is that the corporations and businesses who saw their profits soar during the 1920s did not pass along the uh, profits in the form of increased wages to their workers. And then, of course, this is kind of a similar trend even in today's society. The wealthiest 1% does dominate the overall income within the country. <clears throat> All right, so looking at number eight kind of takes it into contemporary times. <clears throat> the gap is only closed slightly in contemporary times, at least in rhetoric or campaign slogans or the general message coming out of campaigns. The Democratic Party has emerged in contemporary times the champion of the middle and lower class. The Republican Party support <clears throat> across the board tax cuts, which Democrats always demonize as the tax cuts for the wealthy. 
And so that's kind of the general rhetoric or a general, I guess, debate that goes on between Republicans and Demo Democrats. And you can kind of just see with the a little chart there that the overwhelming wealth is still concentrated in the hands of the top 1%. Number nine, why is purchasing items on credit a dangerous practice? Well, citizens who have easy access to credit usually live beyond their means, and that was true as the credit became available in the 1920s, and it continues here into the 2020s. Many Americans like to have nice things, and a lot of people are you know, struggling paycheck to paycheck, but yet they'll you know, spend $800 on a new cell phone or spend you know, upwards of $150 a month on a cell phone plan, and they might have cable TV at home with you know all the bells and whistles and, and that bills $150 a month too so you're ending up you know spending maybe like 300 bucks a month just on you know technology and uh, sometimes uh, people get a little bit out of hand and they figure that they could always pay it back at another point in time a lot of times they make false assumptions that their financial situation is going to improve but often it does not and as a result they get themselves in debt and it's tough to get out of debt Next, we're going to take a look at the impact of buying stock on credit. So when you think about buying products on credit and how dangerous that might be, buying stock and making assumptions that the stock at the prices are going to go up is a very dangerous practice. So the stock market had consistently increased so much during the 1920s that a lot of Americans felt like they were you know, basically missing out. You know, so if you believe you're missing out on a profit and maybe you don't have the money to necessarily invest in the stock market. Uh, sometimes that leads to a situation where you, know, you want to get in and you do something dangerous to kind of get into the stock market. So buying stock on margin is basically just another name for buying stock on credit. And here's an example. I kind of give an illustration of how it might work. Let's say you had an initial, and it could be any number, it could be $100, if you want to look at maybe 1920s money, if you look at $1,000 more so in contemporary society, which would be a decent amount to invest. So let's say you had $1,000, you know, most Americans today could save up $1,000, maybe in the 1920s you could save up $100. But let's say you really wanted to kill it, you wanted to make a lot of money, and you wanted to invest $10,000. So what you did, or could do, is you borrow $9,000 from a stockbroker slash the bank, you invest a total 10,000, you hope the stock market increases, which it really did during much of the 1920s, so let's say 20,000. Then you sell it off, you basically, at least on paper, looks like you kind of doubled your money, and in reality, not quite that much, but you have to repay the stockbroker, the interest, commission, all those different things, so maybe you have to put back 12,000, subtract the initial investment, 1,000, so you basically, you come out with a $7,000 profit. Well, nobody's gonna argue that that's not a good thing, but. The problem is there's no guarantee that that's going to occur. So as soon as you begin to do something kind of risky like that, that's where you can potentially get into trouble because hypothetically that $10,000 total investment in which 9,000 was borrowed, what if it collapses and all of a sudden that $10,000 investment is only worth 2,000? Well, you still have to pay back that loan. I mean, with 1,000 that, that is yours, but you still owe another 7,000 plus interest and commission to the stockbroker slash the bank. As I alluded to before, the reason why people were willing to do something crazy like this is the idea they did not want to be left out. You, know, you saw your neighbor, you know, maybe they're getting their new car or they're getting something added on to their home. And all of a sudden you see well, how they're getting the money for this. They have the same type of job I do. And then they find out they were investing in the stock market. Well, you want in too. Question 12 really deals with things that you can kind of think about for contemporary times. There's different ways you can make money in the stock market. The most common thing is to buy and sell, buy at a lower price and sell at a higher price. That's the most traditional way, and we mentioned that in the example above. So you buy $1,000 worth of stock, you sell it for $2,000, you make you know, roughly a $1,000 profit, or you roughly double your money. You still have the commissions and things like that, but if you do your own money, you're not uh, paying any interest or anything like that. Another way to make money is, let's say you want to do it for the long term. Let's say you invest in a really stable corporation like General Electric, you know, power company, you know, Netflix or something that seems like it only potentially go up or Amazon. 
So as they make money and they report out their earnings on a regular basis, you actually share in their profits. So if you get a dividend, which is a percentage of the, percentage of the company's profit, so let's say you own 10% you know, of Amazon and their profit for the year was a you know, million dollars, you know, then you get a $100,000 dividend, you're 10% uh, of that profit. And of course, you would not have probably enough money to get 10% of Amazon, but for the uh, purposes of the example, that's how it would work. Of course, my tip for any of you that you, is not a stock market tip to invest, it's a stock market overview if you do want to invest at some point in time of your life. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, it's certainly a good thing, but I would always, and this is when I've invested in the stock market, let's say I decide I was going to go on vacation one summer and I decide not to, and let's say I had $2,000 budgeted for vacation. Well, let me roll that into the stock market. That's extra money, discretionary money, not money I'm going to use to make car payments or to make my mortgage payment or to put food on the table. It's just extra money. So electively, you know, kind of discretionary spending instead of you know, going on vacation or maybe buying a new electronic item, you go ahead and invest that in the stock market. And maybe it goes up, you get lucky. But what you want to do when you put the money in the stock market, assume you're going to lose it. Because that way, if you do, you don't worry about it. It doesn't impact your life. But if it's something that you're hoping to put it in on, let's say, October 5th, and then by October 29th or 30th, if you want to sell it so you can pay your mortgage for November, well, that I'm going to say is a bad idea. So as we mentioned, the stock market had gone up for a significant period of time. You could even see that loosely on the green chart below. So the bottom fell out of the stock market on October 29th, 1929. This is remembered as Black Tuesday. The stock market completely collapsed. And then it's going to be like a domino effect. Not Pizza Hut, but domino. The domino impact here would be on the American banking system. Frightened Americans created a run on banks by lining up to withdraw their deposits as they saw the economy struggling. Uh, most banks did not survive the run. It's just often... Uh, as they often lent out their depositors money. So basically, just to understand modern day banks, let's say a bank, you know, the touch and savings or bank in, in town here, let's say it has $100 million in deposits. Well, if you go to the bank, you know, most of that money is not in the bank. It's lent out for mortgages and car loans and things like that. So just a fraction of it is in there. So the interest they pay you on your savings account, well, they make a lot more money on the interest rate they charge for people to borrow the money. And that's how banks basically make money. So most banks did not have much money on hand. So when depositors rushed in, they were kind of cleaned out quite quickly. So many Americans, you can see here, are basically piling into the streets here at the American Union Bank. And as a result, everybody tried to get their money out. And most people could not get any money. And there was no insurance on your bank deposits. So if the bank ran out of money, well, you never got your money back. And when you think about the overall collapse of the American economy during the Great Depression, it's the collapse of the banking system that's far more impactful on uh, the negative aspect of our economy than actually the um, stock market itself. Only about 5% of Americans had money in the stock market in 1929, but almost all Americans had deposits in banks. The American banking system is the foundation of our economy. Banks were devastated by 1932, completely, you know, for the most part, out of business or temporarily closed. And as a result, the entire country struggled. As the Great Depression progressed, how did one way of a job losses lead to further jobs? Well, if it's kind of, once again, back to the domino theory, as businesses struggled, they laid off workers. As workers lost their jobs, they spent less money in the economy, and thus the businesses further struggled. As businesses further struggled, they laid off even more workers, and people couldn't purchase goods, couldn't go out to dinner, things like that. Job losses mounted, and the entire economy begins to collapse. By 1933, nearly 25% of Americans had lost their jobs. When you think about the you know, absolute devastation, that's certainly a high number there. And you look historically at unemployment rate numbers from the 1890s through 2010. You can see how high it was during the Great Depression. Then the one trigger event here is you see unemployment rate went almost down to 0%. This was by the time uh, World War II had broken out and basically everybody was either working in factories or all fighting in World War II. Explain the goals of the Holy Smoot Tariff. And anytime you see two uh, hyphenated names there, that means those are the two sponsors of the tariff bill in Congress. The government attempted to protect American products from foreign competition by taxing imported goods. And that's generally what a tariff is, a tax on imported goods. 
The tariff raised prices to a level that foreign goods could not compete in American markets. European nations raised tariffs on American goods, which created another tariff war, thus a uh, stagnant overall international trade market or strangling the international trade markets, which really further deepened the uh, depression, not just in the United States, but as we're going to see, the depression hits around the globe. So as the United States economy was and remains at the center of the global economy, as the U.S. struggled, so, to, so too did Europe and much of the rest of the, the planet. According to the economist Milton Friedman, there were three main causes of the Great Depression. Kind of the trigger moment, the 1929 stock market crash. That triggered the Great Depression, not just the only cause there of the Great Depression, the run on banks and bank failures, the Federal Reserve mo um, monetary policy, which left too little currency in the economy, are three core ideas behind Friedman. Another economist, John Maynard Kennis, he pointed out some of the root cause of the Great Depression was the failure of the government to react quickly enough to the ongoing weaknesses within the economy. He too put out the money supply. Uh, stock speculation, consumer spending and debt. I'd also throw in there overproduction of goods. What had happened by the late 1920s, factories were still producing goods at a very rapid rate. And eventually people didn't necessarily need a refrigerator or a couch or you know a toaster, but they continue to produce these items. People don't replace these every year. These are kind of long-term or durable goods. And you think your own family, how often are you buying the hot new refrigerator that comes out? Not very often. So Therefore, once you have one, you don't necessarily need another one. What government actions would Kenneth have recommended to prevent the Depression? Uh, government should have spent more money to stimulate the uh, flailing economy. Government-funded jobs. These are things that, at the time, President Hoover did not do. But later on, when President Roosevelt takes over in 1933, he's going to take this advice and do many of these things that are mentioned here. And then a lesson reflection, in the event of economic catastrophe, should the federal government intervene to help businesses recover? How far should they go and why? This is a pretty good debate for contemporary society, even with COVID-19. How much should we do as a government? How much should we be more self-reliant, either on federal or state governments? Or should the individual person be responsible for kind of lifting themselves up and taking care of, taking care of their own issues? Yes, the government needs to be proactive to address weaknesses in the economy. So, so role of the government to kind of take care of all citizens. They should provide money to create jobs or provide direct monetary help to citizens. You can argue no, citizens could become too dependent on the government if it intervenes too much. Taxpayers will have to fund government spending and of course end up with a very high federal deficit. So that pretty much concludes uh, our look at some of the foundation causes of the Great Depression, which we'll look at in more detail as we move forward as we kind of see the different reactions of President Hoover and then later on uh, President Roosevelt. I hope you enjoyed our look at the issues of the Great Depression. Until next time, Mr. Clark is out.